Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming tonight in that crazy, rainy night. Thank you for being here with us. Um, so I am so excited. This is our kickoff program for tonight. This is our first career program for the fall semester, and you're all here. So thank you for being here. Um, my name is Karen Harris, and I am the internship manager and also a career advisor. And I'm joined here by my amazing teammates, um, Jason and Scott and Alan. Um, I'm going to go through just a little bit of an intro, just making sure you're all in the right place. So as the internship manager, when you mention internship to me, I am excited because I look at when students do an internship, you're going to go out there and have this experience that is going to really change things for you. So I want to make sure that you are also as excited. It's, it's a chance to really experience something that you've been studying. It's a chance to test out why you would do this kind of thing. Um, we always look at internships as good or bad. We never think of anything as wrong with any of them. So it's a great opportunity to do that. And we are so excited to have our students today that's going to talk about their experience. So I want to mention a few things because I know that, you know, tonight's event is more giving you the overview of seeing what the students experience this summer and them sharing their experience with you. But you might have some more detailed questions that you would like information on. And on our website, we have a student information section about internships. So you might have basic questions about why you would do it, what's the value of it, um, how to register it. I am so happy this summer, Jason did this amazing thing. He created this um, helper, which is a helper to help you register your internships correctly because we had a lot of students doing different registrations. So this is really some hot off the press. We'll test it out on the next group that's registering their internship. So I'm happy about that. Um, so the big thing that you're going to be wondering about is dates. When do you do it? What time? What's the schedule? Like right now we have the fall internships. People are in their fall internships. But if you're thinking about winter session, you know, it's a good time to start looking for that. And then also the details about the deadline for the winter session internship is there as well. And we're here to help you with any of this process. So when you do get your internship, you have to register it on Artworks. And I'm hoping that you all know what Artworks is. It's the, um, the career portal for even when you signed up to this program tonight. It was through Artworks. And so without saying anything more, I want to definitely turn it over to Jason to introduce our panel of students. So thank you all for coming tonight. All right, well, thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. Um, we've got three speakers, three students that will be sharing their stories from their summer experience. Um, and so our first speaker this evening is Ruth Wandamu. She's a second year Masters of Architecture student. She completed her undergraduate education at Mount Holyoke College with a double major in architectural studies and geography. Ruth is passionate about bringing positive economic, social, and environmental change within developing countries through architecture and urban planning. She's here this evening to share her intern story from the renowned architecture firm Shepley Bullfinch in Boston. So please join me in welcoming Ruth up to the podium. Thank you so much, Jason, and thank you all for coming. Uh, a little bit of background information about me. I am from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, I went to um, my undergrad college, Mount Hoyo College, um, where I double majored in architectural studies and geography. Um, I spent a lot of time in the, time in the studio there um, at the Makerspace. And then after completing my degree program, I started working at Shapley Bullfinch as a design technology specialist. So I was mostly assisting architects with um, 
technological approaches of the firm are um, troubleshooting different problems. Um, in the pursuit of finding my internship, I classified it into three different periods. The first one is the pre-application process. So um, a lot of people think that um, since usually the time to apply during January and is the time is January and February, um, that's when to start. But a lot of efforts and a lot of time goes into the pre-application, which is making sure that you have your portfolio very well done, um, all of your content ready, uh, making sure that your resume is all put together and updated, um, and doing research on companies, uh, where would you like to work? Where do you see opportunities coming up on? Where do you see recent uh, RISD graduates interning? So all of that research, it takes a little more time. And then updating your LinkedIn, um, you can use it in two ways. Um, the first one is in order to update information about yourself so that um, your information is always available in the most uh, updated manner. But the other one is for research. It really helped me try to find companies that I would like to work in and the people that work within them as well. Um, I did apply to certain companies, but I finally decided on Shapley Bullfinch. Um, I did, as I had mentioned, I had worked at there priorly. Um, I appreciated the perspectives that firm had, um, mostly on empowering women and in general my minorities to become um, prosperous within the field of architecture. And I was very interested in how their projects are very much focused on healthcare and education. And I'm extremely passionate about that as well. Um, and then I had my portfolio reviewed. Um, Career Center has these portfolio reviews from different companies. And that comes especially important because you, you get to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about exactly what they need. and. Um, I thought that was extremely helpful. And then I also had uh, priorly formed good connections with the people within the firm. So it was um, possible for me to get a referral. Uh, the interviews were mainly three. Uh, the first one was with HR. So I was trying to find out my general qualification, my skill set, um, what I've learned throughout the year. And then the second one was with the project team. Uh, in that interview, we actually went page by page on exactly what my portfolio content was and how I, that would qualify me to intern at uh, the firm. I thought that was the most important interview. And then the third one was with HR, finding like dates that I'm available and um, how I can be of service. And that was more so a conclusion right before I was offered the internship. Um, after securing the internship, I would say that it's very important to have the internship registered um, through Artworks. Uh, and it's also very important to make sure that um, for international students, the CPT approval is also in process. The Office of International Students is very resource resourceful when it comes to that. Um, it w as an international student, I know extreme how extremely difficult it is to find and secure internships. So when we miss these opportunities, it would be extremely disappointing to finally secure it and not have it go through this process. So I would really highlight that. And then um, the next thing is sustaining communication until start date. You might need certain um, things such as I needed monitors, um, I needed different technological um, supplies. So it's always good to not only um, ask for what you need, but also for what they need. So it's good to sustain communication up until start date as well. Um, at Shapley, I was assigned to a team that was working on McGill University's McLennan Red Path Complex. Um, this project was in Montreal, and it was very interesting. Um, it was a familiar place to go back to um, the firm in general because I knew the people um, to a certain extent, and it felt comfortable for me to talk to them. Um, the first conversation was on exactly what my skill sets are so that we had a very good understanding of how I can help the firm. Um, and the, proje the project was on conceptual design. That means that it's very similar to the day-to-day -day studio of um, architecture, where we were just brainstorming ideas on design and implementing them through drawings and renderings. And I was mostly responsible for 
um, taking that feedback from the conversations that we have and then implementing them in the drawings as well. Um, at Shapley, I've learned the process of continuously iterating work. I think um, in studio, once we produce those final drawings and th those final renderings, that's usually where it stops. But um, working there, we went through so many processes of going back to the drawings, going back to the model, and reproducing um, as much good content as possible. Um, I was also able to gain many technical um, uh, lessons and skills. I learned how to work collaboratively, sharing files and making sure that we were working really well together and communicating well was, was very important. Um, I was also able to extend my internship by about two weeks because it was just a very good environment to work in and there were so many other deadlines that I could help with as well. Um, in conclusion, I would say that um, it is it is time consuming, especially preparing portfolio and websites and all of those um, important parts of the application. So I would say start early on. Um, forming personal connections with people really helps um, both for the current internship or the current process that you have and in the future as well. Um, you never know how people will come in handy in the future. You never know what communications will, se will secure future opportunities as well. Um, using every resource available, um, making sure to complete the registration process, and learning through the process. I think um, being very open to the idea of, um, I don't know as much as, um, or I don't know enough, um, but it's okay because I'm here to learn and people would be very willing to teach, and um, maintaining relationships formed. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Sorry. <laughs> Um, so I know that you said that um, you found this internship because you had previously worked there, but where did you go to like look for internships that you applied to? Um, this internship was actually available on Artworks as, as well. Um, I checked the website of um, the firm that I worked at just because I was familiar with their internship program every summer and I was wondering if, the, if it was available this summer as well. But um, for internship opportunities, I would say um, Artworks has really good internships and just looking up um, during your research, making sure that you really look into how um, what companies are offering research. Um, I'm currently working at the Career Center, so if you come in during drop-in sessions as well, I would be very happy to like walk you through the different ways to um, try to find internships. I'm sorry, I wasn't here in the beginning, but um, could you tell us like when the deadline submission was and also when did you start preparing? Um, the deadlines mostly for architecture firms are in January and February. Um, they could go up until March and April as well, but that would be a little risky. Um, and I started preparing dur mostly during winter session. I invested so much time in the portfolio and resume part of it during winter session. And then I applied as soon as it was January and February. Hi. Um, I was curious, you said you were working in Boston, is that right, where their firm was? Uh, I was just curious what your living scenario was there. Did you have to rent um, or were you supplied any housing? Um, so for the internship, it was mostly remote, but I had to commute one day a week. So every Wednesday, I would take the commuter rail, and um, I would go there at 8 and then come back at 6. And it was, um, so I live in Providence, so it was pretty convenient. I think the Amtrak and the commuter rail system is very, makes it very convenient to commute once a week, at least. Oh, you said you worked there before. What were you doing before when you were working there? Um, my position was called Design Technology Specialist, and um, when I was I was doing my undergraduate program, I worked as the technology consultant at my Mount Holyoke College, at my college. And therefore, um, what the firm was looking for was uh, integration between technology and architecture, and I had both backgrounds to help me get into the field. So I worked as a design technology specialist for about a year, um, allowing me to have some exposure to architecture, but not working in design per se. 
Um, did, uh, did the topic of uh, visa coverage come up as you've worked with Shepley Bullfinch? Um, like, f was there any consideration for a future with Shepley Bullfinch, like post-internship, or are you still keeping in touch with them with the hopes of working with them? Oh, Shepley has continuous conversations, so um, you would have a check-in with um, a certain group of people. And in those conversations, there would be, um, would you be, there would be questions such as, would you be interested in coming back in the future? And I think those conversations are very important. And my answer is definitely yes, because I have a very big respect for the firm. Um, but I wouldn't say we went into details. I'm still, a, uh, I just started my second year, so I think there's two more years to go. But um, I do maintain my connections with the people. Um, not only because I worked there, but because I've formed good relationships as colleagues um, to maintain as well. Um, can I ask, like, uh, what time did you apply for the CPT? Like, is that after you finish your interview? Uh, immediately after I accepted the position, I registered the internship, and then I made sure to apply for the CPT. Hi, um, I'm wondering how did you form personal connections with people in the firms? Do you have any suggestions of like, how you get to know those people? I think it's very similar to how you'd get to know your classmates. I think it's um, more about being very open, um, asking for help, um, helping people whenever they need um, help as well, and just forming genuine connections, I would always ask for career advice. I would want to know um, how they got to be in the place they're in. Um, I think they're all very interesting people. So it's more so about being curious and being very open to talking about what you're passionate about and how people can help you get that as well. Thank you all very much. Okay, our third and final speaker is Sarah Holloway, a junior in furniture design. Her work focuses on locality and internet and handicraft. She spent the past two summers working in the Earth Hand Gleaner Society, an ecological art nonprofit located in what is now called Vancouver, Canada. Working with Earth Hand Community, Sarah led the COVID incentivized project, digitizing the visceral, making in the spaces between. Sarah helped with workshops, gave an artist talk, and hand coded a digital garden representing Earth Hand's one acre permaculture garden called Means of Production Garden. Please join me in welcoming Sarah. <coughs> Sweet. I got like my first common cold in two years. It was such a novel experience for me. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, <coughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so for the past two summers, I was working with the Earth Hand Gleaner Society, um, working in their permaculture garden on the unceded land of the Squamish, uh, Musqueam, and uh, Tsleil-Waututh people. It's um, <laughs> located in East Vancouver. Um, and walking through that garden, um, you are just greeted by these willow trees that are, have grown to hold their hands. These empress trees shoot into the sky um, over 12 feet. And um, it really grew into a, not only um, a garden, but a piece of architecture. Um, I found that in times of isolation, both before COVID, but also during, um, I really leaned into my relationships with non-humans and what they could teach me. Um, so as I was considering what to do for the summer of 2020, I knew that I wanted to learn more from plants. Um, and further, I knew I needed to find people who um, could teach me the lessons that the plants could show me. Um, in ways that um, fit with um, my morals and my ethics. Um, 
And so I came across the uh, Earth Hand Gleaner Society um, through a conversation with a friend who lives in Vancouver. Um, I'm from Canada, I'm from Toronto, um, and definitely um, the way I have looked about getting my jobs a lot of the time has been through straight cold calls. Um, I generally find smaller places. Um, I like working kind of more one-on-one, -on -one, um, and I just call them up, I email them, and <coughs> <coughs> that's what I did with the um, Earth Hand Gleaner Society. Um, it was run by an artist, uh, Sharon Callis, who works primarily with textiles, and that's her right there, actually. And um, actually, the two images above are two things that she's made herself. Um, and we, after a Zoom call, um, kind of devised the digital garden. And it was like a dream project come true because I had spent my um, kind of freshman year at RISD really getting into digital media. Uh, something that I didn't really see myself really leaning into until I had just professors who um, inspired me. And um, when we were chatting about what we had to offer each other and kind of how we could um, form a kind of reciprocal learning um, environment, um, we realized that I knew the technology and she knew the plants. Um, But yeah, the Earth and Gleaner Society, I should mention, um, has a one acre uh, permaculture garden and as well as a, another um, one and a half acre permaculture garden that's a little bit younger. And they grow artist materials for the community um, as well as food and um, run ecological art workshops um, that really look at how to be a producer rather than a consumer. Um, which was something that in my furniture degree was something that had uh, I had been leaning towards. Um, if anyone knows the furniture department, we very much have a um, emphasis on materiality and it was something I wanted to further explore. Um, so what, <laughs> what is a digital garden? Um, unlike, I guess, maybe the past two speakers, um, this was really a kind of self-directed project. I was really just given the prompt how can you make something that holds 20 years of uh, plant growth and knowledge in a hand-coded website um, with my experience of limited coding ex uh, knowledge? Uh, that is the big uh, kind of asterisk. Um, you know, I was working for a nonprofit. They don't maybe have access to the top coders in the country, um, but they do have access to me, um, <laughs> which was, uh, amazing for me. Um, and so I really went with this prompt of like, what is a digital garden? I, um, I'm a big user of Arena. You can actually see all my research for this project on my Arena board um, entitled, What is a Digital Garden? And I also leaned then on um, other kind of art educators that are on that site. And I also uh, contacted professors that I had in the past and asked them, like, what do you think a digital garden is? Um, and they definitely encouraged me as I was trying to kind of figure out the restraints of a project that was really just thrown in my lap. Um, so we devised a plan of pretty much um, documenting 50 plants, uh, cataloging important information like growth time, um, uh, their use, where they originate from, um, and their harvest times, and um, as well as um, how to identify them. And then also trying to emulate the experience of walking through a garden. Um, because before COVID, um, Earth Hand was an organization that was completely, almost offline. And through 20 years of growth and being passed down through multiple artist hands, this garden had grown into what it had become. But um, no one actually knew where any of the plants were. Um, everyone knew that together we knew where the plants were. Not everyone knew the uses for all the plants, but again, together, everyone knew where the plants, uh, how the plants could be used. So um, it was a lot of walking and a lot of talking. And that was the first year that I spent there um, in 2020. Um, and I was just lucky enough that uh, Canada had benefits for students at the time because of COVID. 
and that funded my summer. Um, but the next summer, I came back and um, really, um, after doing all this research and helping them kind of get um, kind of just a small understanding of what we all know, I made the promise of, I'll be back, and I'll actually make the entire garden. And that's what I did. So I was lucky enough to apply for the RISD internship grant, and I got funding through RISD to finish the project. Um, the summer before, I had been given a small stipend from EarthHand um, to help run workshops on mapping the garden and also to give a small artist talk on the research I did, um, just kind of asking people what could a digital version of means of production look like. Um, and so my answer that I gave myself after the first year was, well, um, it's mapping, it's field notes, um, and then to document the, uh, all of the plants, it's analog photography, it is weaving, and it is coding. You know, so like not that much work to do at all for one person. <laughs> um, you know, um, this was a really strong community-based piece and it only was gonna be able to work if I had people signed on to help me, which meant not only did I have to be charming, but I had to make sense. And when you come at someone saying, I'm coding a digital garden using JavaScript and I'm using these uh, randomizers and math functions and, you know, all together with, you know, all these numbers, it's going to come together. No one's listening to you. Like, they've, like everyone there is a textile artist. They don't want to hear what you have to say. Um, so I changed my language and I started using the terminology of textiles. And once I did that, um, it really opened it up. And so we started with paper weaving. We started with hand drawings. And slowly, as you can actually just see through this one example of how the map was made, you, we went from hand-drawn maps, which aren't here, but um, to paper weavings on the far right, to an uh, Google spreadsheet that I could send to people because most of the time we were also still meeting remote or um, distanced. And then finally to the coded, <coughs> the coded map on the far left. And that was done with a lot of information. Um, it was moved. Um, slowly over time. So I'm going to click on this link and just to finish off. Um, oh, I don't know if I can access. Oh. Ah, ha, ha. Um, so I wanted to just briefly show what I did. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was definitely operating in less of a kind of high design world, but I was operating within a fine arts world. And um, Vancouver's small um, in comparison to some other cities and word gets around about you and so soon enough you know I had um, I was lucky enough that a one of the nonprofit galleries in Vancouver um, asked me to be a part of one of their um, online shows um, looking at this work and I was able to meet a lot of other artists in Vancouver um, because of people knowing that I was working on this project um, and so I was able to um, kind of like form a community of artist friends that way. Ah! <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, I don't know, I can answer questions, but I'm taking you guys on a walk right now. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the internship grant gave me the money to buy all the analog film, which was really nice, get it developed. Um, it paid for my housing and my food. Um, and gave me the time to like really mess up coding because I'm not a fast coder, but it's something that I wanted to learn. Um, and yeah, I think I, I'm just walking you through the garden. Um, I'd say just at the end, like for me, what I was trying to get out of an internship experience was, um, I wanted to learn about plants and I wanted to learn how to code. And not many places are going to offer you an experience that gives you both coding and plants. So I made my own. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd say that when it's not there, um, it's just underneath the dirt and you just got to go digging a bit. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm just going to keep clicking because it's fun, but I can answer questions. <laughs> Maybe related to sort of where you left off there, you were talking about how 
you were interested in smaller places. And so a lot of times your process was to cold call or cold email and sort of just go direct to the source, right? Um, I'm just wondering if you have any tips for anybody in the audience who may have similar interests or be interested in in smaller places and is just never done that before, uncertain about how to reach out, anything you can offer. Yeah, um, so three summers before that, um, I reached out to a furniture company um, and asked them for a job. Actually, it was four summers ago, and then they told me no, but try again next year. And so I waited, and then the next year I called them again, and I said, hi, remember me? And then they said, no, actually, we don't have any jobs, but um, you might be calling the wrong person. I'm going to put you in contact with this other guy. And then I got called from them and I ended up working for, um, you know, this really sick furniture company that um, is uh, on a remote island off of Newfoundland, um, working as their design intern. And um, the number one hotel in Canada is also on that island. And it like, I got, and also this amazing artist residency is on this island. So it's a really weird place, but because no one knew about it, I was kind of able to like just continuously be the only person contacting them. And eventually when they had a spot open, it was easier just to hire me than to have to go out into the real world and like, you know, run through interviews. So I would say pick places that don't have job openings and like don't seem like they want to give jobs, um, but are small enough that you're contacting the person who is like the manager. Um, That is like my secret sauce. And also... A lot of the time, people hate saying no, like they feel guilty. Um, So then use that and ask them, do you know anyone else who's hiring? And a lot of the time, they have a friend because we're all like social beings. And um, as long as you're friendly and you're really generous, and a lot of the time, I use a really apologetic tone. I'm like, hi, I have a really weird question for you, but like, I love what you do and I just want to be around it. Do you have anything? No. Do you know anyone like you? Do you have friends? You know, and they're like, oh, you seem so nice. Okay, sure. Like, I'll pass along your info to so-and-so. And, And, um, you know, it's just going in with a smile and and understanding that um, you're talking to another human being. Thank you. I saw a hand over there, too. Thought so. Maybe not. Hi. Um, do you see yourself working in um, larger projects or larger companies in the future, or do you see yourself investing in projects that are very catered to like a particular thing, kind of similar to what you're doing now? I would definitely say I am geared towards um, doing my own thing. Um, I think that I have been trying to collect different experiences that provide me with a really weird, hyper-specific skill set. I study tech, and I study traditional craft fine woodworking. It's a really, like, niche space to be in. Um, And I guess, like, I work best when I work for myself. So I have been trying to um, just create relationships with smaller places that can provide me kind of with the space to work on projects. So that furniture company I worked for like three years ago, I still keep in contact with them. They, we still email like every season, like season change. We're still talking and they'll like let me know about, <coughs> they'll let me know about different job opportunities. Um, but no, I, I kind of see myself doing more smaller things and jumping between, you know, like fine art furniture and fine art digital media. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, I think just, there's a lot of opportunities that can sometimes arise for people who seem very, like, independent in their thinking, and those sometimes, like, come to you because people then hear your name and think, well, this one person has this very hyper-specific skill that we can, you know, draw from. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, what what's next for you? Like, what are your, what's your strategy for this coming year? Or is it still in flux? I'd just love to know what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit kooky. Uh, but I'm a bit kooky. I, uh, 
you know, like I said, um, this project, I'm a really social person. I'm really friendly. I love talking to people. Um, you know, what was great about working on this project is that by nature, I had to talk to a ton of people because I had to get this information out. But also, um, I was given like the freedom on the project to run by my schedule. And my schedule meant that I would take like random days off. I wouldn't take weekends off. I would take like a Wednesday off and then a Saturday. And then sometimes I kind of would just work for five hours every day. And it meant that I went to like gallery openings and I went to like other events because I got to choose my own schedule. Um, so I ended up like running into this guy and he ended up commissioning me like to do a set of furniture for him. So I'm finishing that in the winter. Um, and you know, um, I'm gleaning all of the pieces. So over the summer we collected the bamboo ourselves and then we treated it and we dried it and it's ready to now be made into uh, a desk and shelving. Um, and then from there, um, you know, that's like my winter session plans. Um, he actually works in publishing, so he's helping me document the entire project and we're gonna work it into like an ISP I'm doing on the concept of gleaning. Um, and then I'm hoping in the spring to um, uh, really dive into the crypto world. And I've been in contact with uh, friends of a professor learning about um, just like um, how like uh, blockchains can be integrated into craft. <laughs> yeah, w weird stuff, but yeah, keeps it interesting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm right now making a really big potato battery that's hopefully powering a computer screen, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you said you were studying furniture design. I was wondering how you like got into coding and um, just like this type of work. Yeah, um, so I guess to pre preface, I, um, when I graduated high school, um, I decided to go to uh, school in Toronto because that made the most sense for me. Um, <clears throat> and I took a year of industrial design there. I didn't like the program. I couldn't put like words to why. Um, so then I took a year off and then I came to RISD as a freshman. And I'd say that like a little, that kind of like a little bit of in-between time was what really showed me that like I didn't have to just do one thing. And I realized that I was best when I didn't do one thing. Um, and that was kind of my like best trait about myself is that I love diving into hyper specific things and then jumping out of them and then moving a little to the left and then jumping in there. Um, so I got into digital media because I had kind of like an interest in high school. I took some of it and then I went to a really small, uh, high school and only two people signed up for the grade 12 class. So they canceled it. So that kind of put a damper on my digital media interest because I just didn't have access to it anymore. Um, and then when I was living on Fogo Island, which was where I was, working for the furniture company during my gap year. Um, uh, two of the artists who were in residence on, uh, on the island were digital media artists. And um, especially actually Nora Khan, who just, who teaches in the RISD uh, digital media department, or did, I think is now taking time off or has left uh, to do residencies. She blew my mind. And I then all of a sudden remembered that I had really loved doing it in high school and I just had stopped because it was canceled. <laughs> um, and I started to just do it on the side and I started to get into it. And I started asking like one of my foundation professors who kind of did that stuff, like, how do I learn more? How do I do more of this? Um, and he just sent me a ton of like online resources. And then I realized that like on Arena, there's like so many online resources and that became like my central hub for researching how to code. Um, the School for Poetic Computation in New York is a really great resource. They put all of their um, syllabuses online for free. And that's how I code, learned to code. And I have a learning disability in reading and writing. And so sometimes like spelling something correctly that you have to spell correctly for code to work, I just can't do. And then like, it takes me twice as long. And then I wonder like why I can't do it. And it was a really hospitable environment for me then to learn how to code. 
um, through their syllabuses because it was all about like artists coding. So I kind of assumed that you probably had like impediments like that. Um, and then from there, I really just learned on the fly. I really like, again, like that was the really great thing about being in a small space is that um, I was their only coder. And when like, it really grants grace to an, the amateur. Yeah. <laughs> I learned a ton about JavaScript this summer. <laughs> uh, could you just repeat the name of the school that you were just talking about? The School for Poetic Computation. Um, SFPC is their acronym. It's all online and all on GitHub. And it's like the most valuable coding resource I have found. Sorry, um, in terms of like JavaScript and HTML, like how did you troubleshoot on your own since you were talking about how you were like the only coder and like definitely with like spelling and error, like grammar errors, I know like it's like a needle in a haystack kind of situation. So like how was that in terms of navigating it and then also navigating like deadlines for your internship? Well, the great thing is, is that I was my internship uh, supervisor. Uh, so as long as I was okay with me running past a deadline, uh, I could run past a deadline. I just had like a final due date. So I'm like working independently is something that like I have no problem with. So it worked for me, but um, it, I had to really be diligent. And there was definitely like the first couple weeks when I got to Vancouver and I was pretty much told by like the uh, Sharon who I was working with, yeah, like, I trust you. I don't know anything about coding. So here's a project. Go for it. We'll meet once a week. Check in. But for the most part, she was just teaching me about the plants when we'd meet. And I also would help just um, doing gardening work throughout the week. So there's check-ins, but no one was holding me accountable for having the code because no one knew it. So um, there's definitely a time when I was, like, the first couple weeks, I was, like, sleeping until noon. And I was like, what's wrong with me? You have to get on your shit. And so I just started making a routine. I, I skateboard and I have a friend who's a woodworker and she had to go to like the shop she works at for 8 a.m. So we made like a pact that we would meet at the skate park at 6.30 in the morning and do an hour sesh and then we'd head out. And that was like the thing that got me to wake up and do my coding work and got me to move my body first, which also helped me focus on a laptop and tr kind of negate some of my spelling issues I sometimes have. Um, from there, I just Google. <coughs> I just Googled a ton, um, and then again, I like leaned on friends. And I am a big fan of trading skills, so I would tell a friend like, "I'll make you dinner if you just go through this and tell me if something's spelled wrong," or like, "I will, f I will mount your shelves if you like, again, go through this and tell me if something's spelled wrong." Um, I really lean on like a network of people uh, again because. Um, it was more of a fine arts thing. Um, I didn't have like the traditional sense of a team of people around me. So I just made my team um, in different ways. That and um, like Stacks Overflow online, that's a great place. They're mean in the comments section. Like they'll be like, how do you not know how to do this? It's so easy. But like at the end of the day, you still get your answer. So it's like, okay, whatever. Like, I'm sorry that I haven't been coding since I was five years old. Yeah. I know how to woodwork, do you? Like, you know. <laughs> I can do a perfect bridal joint. Yeah. They don't care. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So thanks, everybody. Real quick, I just wanted to um, bring a couple of things to your attention before we depart tonight. Um, so. We do have a little event coming up uh, called Internship Connect. Actually, it's a big event. And um, it's happening on Wednesday, October 27th, and Thursday, October 28th. Um, last year was our first time doing it remotely, and it worked really well. Um, students had great engaging experiences, and employers loved the experience as well. So we're doing it this way again, safely and effectively. Uh, remotely. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that. We've got this URL here with a dedicated website just for Internship Connect with all the information that you need. 
Um, and on this page, you'll also find that there's a participating companies list. And this list is growing daily. So we uh, think we passed 55 companies today. And there's still some more days left where we expect to see more registrations coming in. You'll see that um, we've got not only the name of the company, it's got a link to their website so you can research them in advance. In Magenta, we're saying what nights they're participating in. And underneath in this encoding, we've got the majors so that you can see which majors they are interested in um, to gauge uh, whether or not you'd you know, be able to, uh, to meet with them. Um, the internship Connect Remote signups are first come, first served, starting at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, October 20th. And to get you ready for that event, we have Prep to Connect. Um, and this QR code actually would take you to the registration um, to register for this event. Um, this is uh, hosted by our own um, senior career advisor, Scott Malloy, who's here tonight. Um, and he'll be presenting the event. Um, and at this event, you'll learn how to speak with company representatives and what questions to ask about their internships, discover what they expect from you, what materials to prepare before the event, and hear the best ways to follow up, and find out how to successfully use LinkedIn to research companies and network before and after the main event. And so again, that's coming up on October 13th at 7 p.m. here at this auditorium. So I'd encourage you to participate in that. And then um, I just really want to thank all of the interns that were brave enough to get up tonight and share your stories. I loved it personally, but um, we see so much success in this event just because it's so fantastic to hear the range of experiences and the potential for all of us to have successful internship experiences. I also want to thank Alan, who's been running the show here tonight, and Scott and Karen, my teammates, for producing the show. Um, and thanks for all of your interest in internships. We really hope that with each of these events, this is a gateway for you to come in and see us if you haven't already. So um, please do come to uh, meet with us. We have drop-ins every day, and we also have um, advising appointments every day. So we're available to talk to you uh, tonight if you'd like to follow up. Uh, but that'll do it for tonight. So thanks for being here, and good luck with your internship plans.